Well, they used to say, let everybody say amen. And in the traditional churches years ago, it would be quiet and uh, as if God couldn't stand the sound or it was immodest to have some expression. And then it was a clapping 25 years ago, 20 years ago, it was clapping, so you clapped. Our church still doesn't clap, it's a shame. They clap for the music, but they don't clap for the preaching. And maybe there's a message there, right? I don't know, but <laughs> whatever. But now we say, give it up for. That's, that's the new phrase. Now hold it, I want you. <laughs> that wasn't that good. But uh, uh, I want to say just a personal word because the Bible says give all glory to God, but it does say give honor to men. Have you ever thought about that? Those that honor me, I will honor. And the visibility of God's honoring is manifold, and we won't go into that. But uh, this man here, David and Barbara, before the children were born, uh, we knew them, and I would visit him in his office off 77, down behind the 55-mile-hour speed limit sign. I mean, it was a no place. And I could see in his eye, and we all sensed in his presence that God had something grand. And I don't come down this far. Somehow, when you're around South Park and 51, you don't come down to South Carolina. <laughs> but uh, I keep thinking I passed it. Uh, on 521. And uh, then I turned in this morning and I said again, wow. Absolutely wow. What God has done. Little is much when God is in it if you obey. And this man and his precious wife and now their terrific children have really given themselves wholeheartedly without reservation to the Lord. And this property is just the beginning. I said to my brother, uh, this morning, there's another wave, there's another crest that I think is coming in his ministry. You get to the top of the bell curve, and then when the spirit moves, he blows again, and a new vision, and a new dream, because this is not it yet. This is not it yet. I may not live that long. I'm getting so old that my social security is in Roman numerals, and... Uh, <laughs> My next driver's license, they'll probably uh, deny it. Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Put your hand over one eye. You know, I can't see out of one eye, and I have a contact in the other. So what benefit is there? <laughs> good morning to you. <laughs> Praise be to the Lord and honor. All the honor and glory goes to Jesus, but a special word of commendation to these servants and to all of you who serve. I'd like to read some scripture. If you just want to listen to it, that's fine. It's from two passages in the book of Hebrews. Of the 9,630 words in the book of Hebrews, you could say it's saying one thing, move on. Say that with me, move on. You find this in chapter 6, where after announcing who Jesus is and what he did, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and so on. Chapter 1 is glorious. He tells them to move on, to get beyond the first principles, the basics of Christianity. Now, we all know what the basics are. This is the gospel that I received. You never can give anybody anything if you haven't received it. You can tell them about it. And then he says, by which you were saved. How that? How was I saved? how that Christ died, was buried, and rose again, according to the Scriptures. In other words, that announcement had been made before, and our Lord Jesus filled it full with meaning. This is the gospel. And there's not one person in this room this morning that hasn't heard that, understood that, committed to that. And I would imagine that's why you've placed yourself not in a job position, but called to the ministry. It's good to be called. And you remember the ministry is many faceted. It's not just teaching, and it's just not ruling. It's not just executing. The greatest uh, announcement and title that was given to Jesus was he was a servant. So this morning, I would like to read some scripture about the other side of Jesus. This uh, explosion, this terrorism in Boston 
revealed the total uh, brevity of life and how fragile uh, life is, your body is. 32 people were amputees, legs and arms thrown into the air. That's what we're seeing. Overshadows Syria, overshadows the tax problem, overshadows guns. How instantly life can change for many people. Now, what would the gospel have to say to that? Where's the word of Jesus? We sang about it this morning, the comfort of all who need. Let me just read several verses of scripture and talk about Jesus in a light that you may not have looked at for a long time. May the Holy Spirit take that which is convenient and relevant and familiar to a deeper level. Maybe this morning God will help us to move on. Say it again, move on. Move on be side the peripheral and the incidentals and even the core of the gospel. Listen to these words. For we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels. First thing is mentioned, suffering death. Then crowned with glory and honor, that's his resurrection, that he should by the grace of God taste death for every man. For in that he himself suffered being tempted he is able to succor. It's an English word that means to help or come to the aid of them who are tempted. Seeing we have this, and then it changes because of the custom and because of the audience. Seeing that we have a high priest, but not like other high priests who were just human, who did their preaching and their enunciations and their offerings daily, repetitive, because there was never a culmination of sacrificial systems. He was touched and is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, for he was in all points put to the test as we are, yet without sin. What do we do about that? We know the next verse. We come boldly to the throne of grace that we may be able to find that succor, that comfort in time of need. Praise be to Jesus. Give him honor by saying amen this morning. Amen. Have you ever thought about how Jesus felt? I couldn't look. I admit we just saw two or three segments, but I, I could not look at the scourging of Jesus again in the series Bible. I remember the first time we saw that, when Mr. Graham and Mrs. Graham and Franklin and uh, five or six others in the little theater at the Greenbrier Hotel uh, with Mel Gibson. I remember how uncomfortable we all felt and how Mr. Graham was asked to say a word and he said, I can't say anything. That was so vivid, so transcendent in its imagery. And so was the Bible. Not as graphic, but there it was in all its vividness. The terrible, the word today in the news is horrific suffering of our precious Lord. How many are glad he took your sins on the tree and rose again? Say amen. amen. Yes. Don't be afraid to interrupt. Wait till the end of the sentence. <laughs> How did Jesus feel? How did these people feel? We got a call last week from our daughter who has a friend her age in 40s or probably less. Lost one baby in a miscarriage. Second baby was to be born. It was born. And it was born without a forearm. In fact, out of the elbow uh, came a hand, two hands. Terrible, tragic, unfortunate, lifelong trial. Christian people who love the Lord. How does Jesus feel about our sorrows, our difficulties, our betrayals? Not a person in this room this morning that hasn't been betrayed. Well, there are seven expressions of the side of Jesus that we never think about that I want to link with you today. Seven's a perfect number. The first feeling that he felt was the feeling of deprivation, of being tempted because of physical longings. The second is this temptation for releasing your purpose early. Jump off. The devil does everything to get you distracted from the cross. And the third, of course, was 
that we need to venerate him and worship him and honor him since he's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2. Look, nobody's looking. I deserve some credit. And credit grabbing, grabbing is the final hiss of the serpent. When we want credit, when we want glory, when we desire it, if it's given to us unannounced or almost unwelcomed, then we should accept it and give him glory. But here is Satan in his true garb, unmasked, asking in a groveling way all of the kingdoms of the earth and all the glory that comes with it, the great package that's in the end of the Lord's prayer. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. He says those same words. If you'll just bow down and recognize me. The temptation of our Lord is followed by the, by the anger that Jesus had over his disciples. Who were shoving the children away. He turns and in anger I would have loved to hear, hear his voice. Stop doing that. Allow the children to come unto me. One of the greatest ministries in the world is a ministry to children. And how about the temple? When, if you had Roman money, which you did to buy Panera, and you came into the temple, you had to have Jewish money for the offering. So they exchanged it and charged a higher rate than would be going in the street. And our Lord, in that time, he actually does it twice, but toward the end of his life, he comes in and turns that over. And in a scolding way, actually making out of the rope that probably covered the little boxes of the pigeons and so on, he wraps it like women wrap a braided hair and makes a scourge and in a whipping way flashes it before these people and says, you misunderstand the whole purpose of my coming or of my father's house. My father's house is a place of prayer not preaching, not music, not contemplation, musing about might have beens or wants, a place of prayer, of adoration. I would say that's the least known characteristic of an American church. But there was a little more there. They were manipulating the worship process in order to accommodate the marketplace. And in the process, they denuded Worship of its ultimate meaning. We do that. Oh, that's what we do. We just travel all the time. You don't care about that. But we have a multiple uh, plethora experiences of churches all over the world. And a lot of them have adapted. Compromised is a stronger word. That's almost judgmental. But they find out what the culture likes and then stream their worship to what the culture wants and select passages of the scripture which almost become like an onion in a steak sandwich. It's an additive like sweet and low in order to make the worship and the appeal of coming to the church compromised away from the sting of the gospel. And it's a trend that I pray someday you all will fight against. America needs a prophet to bring America to revival and repentance and to the core of what the gospel is. It's not about me, really, and I'm glad it's about me. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. But is it not about Jesus? Is it not about what he did and what he will do? And someday he's coming soon. The Swedish translation of the passage in the Old Testament is, his coming is as sure as the dawn. These are some of the emotions of Jesus And the last of the four, and then I want to hit the three and finish, is in the garden, where our Lord comes to the depth of desperation. The language is very strong. If you want to look at it again, please do in Matthew. It says, he says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. The common language would be, this is about to kill me. Exceeding sorrowful, all alone. Pops of blood from his head. This is the essence of what Jesus did to drink the cup of sin and despair and the judgment of hell. I know that's heavy this morning, but that's how our Lord felt. And in that cup are the feelings of all of us of temptation 
of trial, of frustration, of the fact that we have not really moved on as far as we should in the Christian life, and how many times depression and this kind of overwhelming pressure takes us over. The latest stat is that the highest rate of suicide among pastors is in South Carolina. We had a conference just to allude to that, but not as the main purpose, in Orlando last week. We made a little shoebox at Calvary 20 years ago. Franklin called us. A man in England had said, we want to make a little box gift to some of the school children. Would you help me? And Franklin said, sure. But unlike Franklin Graham, he forgot about it. And it came around Thanksgiving. And his secretary said, that man from England who you said you were going to give boxes to was on the phone. Franklin said, tell him I'm working on it. He hung up and called me and said, I'm stuck. Can you help me? Carol made a box. We held it up at Calvary Church 20 years ago. And in two weeks, we got 11,000 boxes. He got 2,000 boxes from Boone. We put the boxes in uh, U.S. Air, went to Bosnia during the war, and handed them out in the snow to children who had been bombed out. Well, this year, the total distribution number of these shoe boxes is 100 million. And we had a conference for this in Orlando and heard some of the stories of the children. The point that I want to make is that you and I have to remember that the purpose of Jesus' ministry is giving. He gave his life a ransom for many. The three emotions that I want to highlight and relate to you today. Because it says he was put to the test in all points such as we without ever sinning. During the conference in Orlando, they assigned me a man to walk me to the convention center. We had 102 countries 4,000 people came for this great event. During that event, the second day, Steve was his name. I don't know his last name. He called me on the cell phone and said, I can't uh, come with you. He was in a second marriage, and the daughter by the first marriage uh, committed suicide. And he said, I have to leave. We had three people in that conference out of 3,000 people who, in one way or another, in their family or personal relationships, had a suicide attempt. Our Lord feels those deep feelings. It says he became the sacrifice for sin and took death for every purpose, for every person. The first one I'd like to just highlight is the compassion of Jesus. It said of our Lord that he looked over the city and he wept. He had sorrowful feelings about people. I wonder whether you and I have lost that vision in the ministry here. I know you haven't. I want to suggest it, not to pick a hurt or to accuse in any way. I'm a guest. But do you realize the impact and the far-reaching global effect of what you do every day? You may not be on camera. You may not be a music person. You may be in this company a nobody. It's funny, when you go to a conference, you get a badge. And the more important you are in people's eyes, you get a big badge. <laughs> Most people got a badge, Uganda, whatever. Uh, I had a bigger badge. In fact, I had the biggest badge because they honored me with the video and so on. But I also was the one to first create a box and collect them. Then I'm also uh, a vice chairman, emeritus of Samaritan's Purse. And I'm also the chaplain of the Billy Graham Association. You see how long my sign's coming? <laughs> and then at the top, I'm the chaplain, but special assistant to Franklin Graham. How good that is. No, it's scary. <laughs> it's scary. And I said to myself as we threw those, bag, those badges in the trash when we came home on Tuesday, suppose my badge had said nobody. Paul says, some plant, some water, but they're nothing. It's God who gives the increase. My point is here, don't ever feel insignificant. Don't ever feel like a footnote, because we all serve the Lord's Christ. Say amen to that. Amen. Our Lord saw people. He saw people. 
Are you sensitive to that? Are you sensitive to the fact that you serve the Lord Jesus, but Christ came into the earth to save sinners, and it broke his heart. He saw them, Matthew 9 says, as leaderless, sheep without a shepherd. He saw them as meandering. He saw them as lost, the story of the three lost things in uh, Luke 15. Lost. He's come to seek and to save the lost. It's hard not to get your ire up and to get angry. I wish some of these politicians would get angry. Just say something a little nasty uh, about what's happening in our country, uh, about homeless people, about whatever. There, don't, don't, don't you feel sometimes ticked off? Say amen. amen. It's said of Lot, even though it was his fault, that the sin of Sodom vexed him. I want to know what vexes the American Christian. Does it vex you that the church is meandering and wandering and doesn't have a goal and everybody has a big church and nobody cares about anybody else? Everybody has their own little ministry. It's about me and my ministry. Doesn't that vex you that we can't get evangelical leaders to cooperate? I said to Franklin recently on the QT, why don't you just call the 10 or 15 ministers and just say, America, pray. I mean, That'll hurt, that won't hurt your ministry, right? Just pray. He said they wouldn't come. I said, you're right, they won't. What is it about us that we've lost the central focus of the unity of our purpose and the globalization of the gospel and the passion we ought to have and the lostness of people? All the prophets, Jonah, Micah, all these people began their letter by saying the burden of Jonah, the burden of Michael. Do we have any burden? Do we have any weight on us that just ticks us off, that motivates us? Somebody should say whether it came in a pressure cooker and they're now saying they hope it's a white person. Can you imagine such a thing rather than a person of color? They're not talking about Afro-Americans, of course. They're talking about Middle East. Would you think somebody would say, stop this idiocy? We're talking about people. This violence has got to stop or whatever. I don't know what they should say. Thank God I'm not a politician. Everybody say amen. amen. I'm not a politician. <laughs> but is there anything that's going to exacerbate or disturb or awaken this nation? Maybe if we have a dozen of these events, like 9-11, which easily was forgotten, other than the sticker on our front door, to say something needs to be done. Let's look to God. Let's call upon him. And I'm not saying you should be cheerleaders for that. But don't forget that. Our Lord had compassion for people. Listen between the lines when people are talking. Don't just listen to what they're saying. Listen with a third ear. The second thing, of course, about our Lord's emotion is this, is this great despondency. Depression is so common, so frequent, you all may have seen the Bible, and there's one thing about the Bible among a dozen things that I didn't like. I wish they would get the actors that talk like Jews or Arabs rather than somebody from Cambridge. Oh, yes, bless you. <laughs> Mary is about to give birth on the donkey. It's raining and the sand is blowing and nobody's in the street. Hey, it was a time of taxation. Somebody was up walking the streets looking for a doornail, right? He says to her, we're almost there. Oh, that's a wonderful line when your wife is in the last minutes of labor. We're almost there. Come on, give me a break, right? When our Lord Jesus is riding on that mule, they have him laughing. Like this. He's on the, mule, on the donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now. And he's going like this. Luke reports he's crying. Luke says in the strongest Greek word possible, he's sobbing. Like some of those people yesterday. Why do people grab their mouths? Because they're not sure they have the next breath. And they, they're totally out of control. And a man yesterday was just, <laughs> he couldn't get the sadness out. He kept expectorating sadness. 
overwhelmed. This is Jesus. He's bouncing up and down, and he looks at the people, and he says, if you only knew. If you only knew that in less than 40 days, Titus, look it up, Google Titus, close to 600,000, they said in the movie, 100,000, 600,000 Jews were, were slain. They tore the chapel down, the, the main temple, Herod's, the Herodian temple. They tore it down and then sowed salt in the dirt so nothing would grow for many, many years. Destroyed the city and the temple. The final exodus, as it were, of any promise and any hope until Jesus. Say amen to that. Amen. If you only knew. If we only knew what's coming, we would warn America. The Booth who founded Salvation Army, he said if every Christian would spend five minutes in hell, he'd be a different Christian. Five seconds would be enough for me. The wicked shall be cast into hell. I know this is heavy this morning. And all the nations that forget God, if we only knew. This may only be the beginning. What will happen in this world before the evacuation of the church, whatever position you put the timing, before the tribulation or after the tribulation, don't worry about it. God has you as we sang tomorrow. We can face it easily. But Jesus said, I cry because you should realize what it means to have known me and had hardness of heart or thought my mission was only political or temporary. Whatever they meant. I've heard hundreds of sermons and I've preached, I don't know how many, who cares, on the Palm Sunday message. If they only knew what was coming, to have the gospel available and do nothing about it. To have the truth of the gospel known and understood like these Hebrews. Move on because there remains no more sacrifice for sin. You turn Jesus down. It's the last offer. There's nothing else coming. The gospel is finished in the completed work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you only knew, America, if you only knew in your own life, we have to hurry Probably the third closest friend I have, lay friend in Charlotte, is dying of cancer. If he only knew that when he had that cigar every night and that glass of wine, before he came to know Jesus as a mature adult under our ministry, if he only knew the consequence and the danger of that, if he only knew. You may be this morning, and this is a point of, of minor conviction, if you only knew the consequence that will come to your life by not moving on, by being a ho-hum Christian, by neglecting the Word of God, by not praying in a consistent, intentional way, by failing to witness to people for whom God will hold you responsible, will there be any blood on your skirts, the passage in Ezekiel, Will he require the souls of men and their record partially because you didn't share the gospel? There is a cause and effect. How beautiful are the feet of those who publish good tidings. If you only knew. Now is the time. Paul says this to the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians 6.2 Now is the time for salvation. And it doesn't mean salvation be saved. He doesn't preach be saved in Corinthians. He preaches stop being so idiotic. Stop arguing. Stop the schisms. Stop drunkenness in the Holy Communion. Stop this uh, particular favorite doctrine that you champion and are known by. Move on. God will deliver you. He will rescue you from the triviality of things that cause you not to be the Christian person that you ought to be. Are you the Christian person you ought to be? I'm not. I repent 
of the, not, of the fact of not praying enough. I repent that I don't study enough, and even though that's my ministry, my calling. Probably 10 hours on this morning's talk. But there's more I can do. God's not finished. What in my life is retarding my advancement as a man of God? What in my life is lessening the glow of Jesus? What in my life is making me less effective than I could be? What is it, Lord? Here am I. Here am I. I see the smoke. I see the seraphim. I see the lostness of Israel. I see that. But here am I. What about me? The old country churches used to sing, it's me, it's me, O Lord. I'm the one standing in the need of prayer. The last joy is a happy one. Say amen. amen. It says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, he saw the joy that was set before him. He stuck it out. He didn't come down when they said, come on down. You can solve the whole thing. The joy that was set before him. That is celebrant theology. That's when we should shout. That's when we should praise the Lord. When we realize in the depths of sorrow, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. It pleased God to bruise him. When God made his soul an offering from, for sin, when God put him to death, all oh, the Romans and the Jews, that's just footnote theology. It was God who said, I will make his soul an offering for sin. And by that, all men who believe in him can be saved. Then all men who don't believe can be saved. John says he's the propitiation for our sins. But not for our sins only, 1 John chapter 2, but for the sins of the whole world. Aren't you glad that the gospel is not exclusive? Give me an amen on that. It's not just for a few in the West who hear this. But what about the people and the nations of the earth that maybe only get one little ray of gospel from this network, who may only hear one little word in the shadow of the sun? For the heavens declare the glory of God, therefore all men are without excuse. We have so much. For that we are much more responsible. And when we realize what Jesus has done, tempted, tried, frustrated, anger, lonely, betrayed, caring for people, disappointed, even to the place where he said, like the people who commit suicide, this thing is going to kill me. And because it is, I'm going to take my life. Isn't that sad? But the passage says, he tasted death for every man. And because of the cross, he bore all these sins and sorrows. You know that song? He took our sins and sorrows and made them his very own. You can rejoice this morning that the fullness of God is the Lord Jesus. And he has implanted in you that fullness, that completeness, that wholesome salvation joy that you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. 1 Peter 1, 5, ready to be revealed at that time. I think when I get to heaven, I'm concluding. The one thing I will regret is the lost blessings that I had lost in life because I wasn't more obedient, more holy, more prayerful, and more sensitive to the purposes and the meaning of the gospel. That will be my regret. Because some will get there so as by fire. Some will be there only by the grace of God. Because every man's work, every man's talent will be tested. Whether it's for the kingdom, whether it's for the glory of God, whether it's for Jesus Christ. If any man's work abide. That's what I want. Maybe scratched between the two dates on that slab, it'll say, his work abides. May that be true of you. May that be true of this magnificent ministry. In the lap of the Cirillos has been placed 
an unbelievable opportunity with massive credibility and resources from people who gave the money for those little trees that I parked in front of out there on the lot. What opportunities you've been given, don't minimize the fact that you only have five loaves and two fishes and you didn't get your name in the Bible. Realize that everything you do, even in eating and drinking, due to the glory of God, and he keeps record. Hebrews 10, 6. God is not forgetful of the things that you have done in Jesus' name and for the cause of Christ. God bless you. Give it up for Jesus and for the cause. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for Jesus, the risen Christ. Hallelujah. And for the privilege of ministry. Thank you so much. To God be the glory. What's the next line? Great things he hath done. David, thank you.